months of our lives inside Either in traffic at work or close eyes How about we all agree that it's way overdue to take back our lives Welcome into the Work Wherever podcast. I'm your host, Roy Edwards. If this is your first time here, this is the podcast where we talk about remote work, hybrid work, the future of work, and uh, all things automation. This is technically a tech podcast, but we do focus in on remote work, future of work, hybrid, which is why it's called Work Wherever podcast, because we believe that the future of work is shutting down the office space, giving employees back their life, and allowing them to carry on as if every day is Saturday, which is the trend. That's the theme. That's the driving force behind this show is live every day like it is Saturday. And so today we're going to get into how to lead in a hybrid environment. So hybrid, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, would be a mixture between office employees. So you have an office space, you have members who are still in that office space, which could be a warehouse, it could be frontline workers, it could be sales reps, it could be whoever, you know, it doesn't have to be physical cubicles that we're talking about here, right? Your your, uh, workforce can still be remote out in the field, right? You can still have your first line workers that are out in the field, or you can have frontline workers who are in an office space. So, but whatever the, the makeup is, is, There is some capacity of members in a physical location where they are together collaborating and then a non-physical location of remote, hybrid, remote employees. And when I say hybrid remote employees, I mean that employee might come to the office once a week, once a month, doesn't matter how many times, but that's the idea of the hybrid work environment. Similar to in cloud computing, you have the cloud, which is everything to a somebody else's servers, right, that you pay month to month, or maybe you have purchased it outright in a dedicated server or something like that. But you're you're paying per usage of the application in a cloud environment. So it's running on multiple servers. That's what cloud means, right? Cloud is not like it's sitting in the sky somewhere. Cloud is somebody else's servers that you don't have to maintain, and they are responsible for the physical security and the physical well-being of those servers that you do not no longer have to care about. Hybrid, in that sense, would be you still have some on-premise servers that you maintain. Maybe you have one or two servers in your server room, and then the rest are in a cloud for so that you can scale up and scale down relatively quickly. Same thing would be with the hybrid environment for your human resources, where Like we have an office space, technically nobody's there, but we have it where we can scale up if we need be. We can go and everyone can meet in a conference room if we really wanted to. We could take over the whole floor. We could do, you know, there are scalable capabilities within a uh, a remote or hybrid remote office space, which, you know, WeWork was a big one. Uh, There's uh, Regis, I think, is one. We use a, a local company. I think it's JLL, I think is what, or JJL or something. Uh, but there's tons of them out there, right? Just Google, like, remote office space. And I'm sure there's, like, 15 in a, a 10-mile radius of you. They're everywhere. So, but w- this trend in hybrid, remote, which was extremely escalated through the, the COVID crisis, pandemic, whatever you want to call it, the... 2020. Prior to 2020, there were uh, still remote workers, I being one of them, but it was less common. And it certainly wasn't talked about as it is talked about today. Capital Presence, when we became a company in 2016, our original hashtag was work wherever. That was our original hashtag. 
and I had a, a CMO at the time, uh, and I pitched him and I said, hey, I think that we should run a campaign called Don't Go to Work. And the idea behind it would be that you shouldn't go to an office space, that you should allow your team to work wherever. That should be the running, you know, don't go to work. I purchased the domain, don't go to work and everything. And I, and I ran this, I, well, I wanted to run this campaign. I did run it small, what, you know, but he nixed it. Because, not because he wasn't forward thinking or anything like that, but it just wasn't widely accepted. There, he didn't believe that, and he was probably right, that at the time that sort of a campaign would would go over well with enterprise organizations because, and the statistics showed, that at that time organizations wanted their employees in the office, which prior to COVID, this, this uh, reading, I'm reading a statistic now from McKinsey, it says that 99% of executives expected employees to spend more than 80% of their time in a physical office space before COVID-19. So that was a study that that they had they had run, which 80% of the time that is four days a week. So you get one day a week remote, which was pretty, pretty common that there were a lot of federal organizations, enterprise organizations where remote work was possible, but you were still going to the office more so than you were remote. It was very rare that you had a five day remote work. And, it, and if you were a five day remote work employee, it was possible that you were still at a uh, office space of some some sort you weren't at home now I, I was but it was very commonplace for if you worked for a technical contracting company that contracted to a larger enterprise or to a federal government organization that you worked from your contractors location and supported your client remotely so if you were supporting the army so to speak and the army client was out of california then your work location was at an office building in Virginia, for instance, and then that that is how you supported the client. You were still at a, at an area that had high speed internet, which was a lot of the reasoning behind working from an office location like that. Is you had like a T one or you had an Ethernet, whereas at home maybe your internet wasn't as one as wasn't as as good as fast. But internet has certainly caught up over the last five, certainly ten years, and even over the pandemic, where we're starting to see more hybrid. Uh, or high speed internet access, you know, we see the the increase in things like Starlink and stuff like that, where it's no longer the satellite plug and play pay as you go type internet, where you start starting to see this faster internet to more rural environments. That certainly plays plays a role. Now, post COVID, they ran a similar survey. And so now it's shared by a, a mere 10% instead of 80%, but the thought process is a mere 10% of those employees were, would be expected to come into the office. So 10% is less than once a week. So that is, uh, that's pretty wild, the difference and change there. So what has sparked that change? Well, now COVID has certainly opened the eyes of many to say that, you know, maybe we are overstaffed, maybe we can do more with less. That's certainly part of this. Maybe uh, maybe members of our organization are more productive. Maybe we've spent an, a, a lot of money on the digital infrastructure of our organization and we want to see this through, through automation, because this is the future of work. I believe it's that. I believe that we are starting to, to see and starting to realize that we don't need an office space. And many people were not really coming to visit us anyways. It was just this idea of getting people together because that's how we believed that they were most creative and they were not distracted when really the office space now has been kind of seen as a potential distraction where you have the kitchen, you have the office gossip, office gossip you have members within the office that uh, walk around to kill time. They're not actually working as much as maybe we thought they were. At, in an office location similar to education, where we're starting to see this rise in homeschool, uh, which was never thought of as really a normal activity prior to uh, COVID, not no offense to anyone who homeschooled prior to COVID, it was just it wasn't as widely accepted as it is post COVID because of their the amount of resources and the normalization and the uh, politics behind it that has escalated post-COVID uh, has greatly increased. You did have, obviously, you had 
homeschoolers prior to, you know, there have been some huge names of people, uh, celebrities alike, that have been homeschooled, and it's totally a normal thing for somebody pr prior to COVID to be homeschooled. It's just now we are seeing it more so along the landscape of, of America, where it's more widely widely accepted. And because of that, there has been studies that, that are asking the questions, how much educational time are students really getting in, an, in a traditional education setting? And it is extremely low. If you read the studies, it's they're there for eight hours, but they are not really learning for eight hours. It's much smaller. It's I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's it would it, it's something like a fourth of the time or lower um, that they're actually engaging in education. And so that physical, well, if you think about it, you're like, well, they're at school. They must be learning the whole time. Well, no, they're not. And that same thought process exists within the office space to say, well, you're at work. You must be working the whole time. And anyone who's ever been to an office knows that that's not the case as well. So that's where remote work comes into play. You say, okay, well, if they're at, not at, if they're at work and they're not working the whole time, well, what if we put them home? Then you have the ability to work longer hours because you can start sooner. Uh, they're more comfortable. Okay, the technology exists, the automation exists. So, so now it becomes, well, how do I make sure that they're actually working, right? That's the biggest question that a lot of organizations come to me is like, well, how do I know if they're working? Well, without getting too big brother, we're gonna get into that as the managerial side of things. So that's what the topic of the podcast is today is how to lead in a hybrid environment because that's been a lot of the questions that I, that I get. So, and because the leadership prior to now that we say okay we will let them go home we know that they'll be more comfortable they'll work longer hours that they'll they'll uh you know enjoy themselves they'll see it as a benefit and see it as a perk now how do i know that they're working right how do i how do i get around my impromptu conversations how do i get around the walking down to somebody's office and knocking on the door and walking in how do i effectively manage my workforce now that i can't see feel smell and touch them <laughs> right that's, those are the questions, and I have three topics of conversation for you. The first one being you need to stop thinking about managing as seeing your employees and start thinking about it as seeing results. So stop thinking about it seeing the physical person and start thinking it of seeing the results. And that is done by managing performance through outcomes, impact, and ownership. So who owns what? How is that? ownership of a project being impacting my organization, my clients, and then what are the outcomes, the measurables, the KPI indicators that I can track around these things. And so this is really where I think the future of work is going is around KPI metrics. I have said long on this podcast and I've said it on social media platforms and speaking engagements and uh, you know, podcast interviews that I believe that the future of work is not an 80 hour work week. I don't believe it's a, I don't believe it's a, a, a measured hourly work week at all. I think it's a zero hour work week where the, our compensation is built entirely on Im impact outcomes and ownership, meaning you're performance based. So you are a performance based employee where you can clearly articulate what it is that you got done in a given week. What is assigned to you? What do, what do you have ownership of? And what the impact of your outcomes made on an organization? Meaning we, uh, I did X and it generated Y for the organization. And so we do that internally through Azure DevOps. And so Azure DevOps is a tool, it's a, it's a board. There are a bunch of other boards out there. Uh, it's essentially a Kanban board built for the Agile uh, Scrum experience, but you don't necessarily have to use that tool. If you're using Microsoft Enterprise licensing, it's free to you. So you can, uh, I believe it's, uh, it's like visualstudio.microsoft.com or something like that, or visualstudio.yourdomain.com. But it, it, it used to be called Visual Studio Team Services. Now it's called Azure DevOps. If you Google Azure DevOps, it'll probably pop up and you'll be able to log in with your company credentials and then you have your free board. If you're not a Microsoft user, one, I don't know what you're doing, <laughs> kidding. But there are other tools. Uh, Jira by Atlassian is very similar. A lot of people have heard of Trello. Um, and then even within the Microsoft platform, there is Planner, 
uh, and Microsoft Project as well, which we did a podcast on project management tools that so you can go and check that out. It's where we talk about all the different ways that you can track what is it you're doing. And so on that board, you have your ownership, you have your accountability, you have a daily stand up where you're asking your team members, what is it that you're working on? And then at the end of your metric period of time, we use two week sprints, you have your outcomes. So what are you responsible for every day? Hey, what are you responsible for? You tell me what you're responsible for. At the end of a measurable period of time, you have your outcome. What did you get done? And then at another measurable period of time, likely a quarter, you have your impact, which is man management and managers can see through KPIs. They can say, we got X amount of outcomes done this month. Here are the members that got them done. And it had this impact on the organization. So that's the first step. The first thing that you want to do is what are you, what are your KPIs? You know, what what outcomes are you looking for? What type of impact are you looking for? And then how are you going to track ownership uh, of these tools? That's step one. Number two here we're going to get into now is you need to do more building trust and togetherness within your organization, regardless of where they are. And you can do that really through four different talking points or four different uh, avenues. One being reliability. So you need to be reliable. You need to, to when you guys say that you're going to have a meeting, you need to be on that meeting. When you are, uh, say that something is, you're going to do something, you need to do it. You know, may your yeses be yeses and your noes be noes, right? You need to be reliable because the less reliable you are as a leader, the more that your employees are going to slack off. So you need to now more than ever lead by example. There was a bad habit of leaders and managers in the office space to not be in the office even though their employees were in the office maybe they would be out to lunch or they'd be walking around or they would be late to the office or there was this idea that the the manager or the uh, higher up so the supervisors could kind of willy-nilly come in as they please and didn't necessarily have to lead by example but in a hybrid remote environment that becomes extremely important to lead by example. It's always important, but it is doubly as important in a hybrid remote environment because you have to set the tone. You need to be reliable. May your yeses be yeses, your noes be noes. Next would be acceptance. So in a hybrid remote environment, you're going to be dealing with a lot more things that you wouldn't be dealing with in an office space. There's the good and the bad. Since you are at home, your employees are going to have more access to children, their children or their community or their dogs or other things around them because that's just part of working from home, assuming they are working from home. And so you will have more and more things happen around uh, your employees. And you as a leader should be accepting of some of those things. You need to be accepting of your employees and how that they are living their lives and, and the lives that are happening around them because that's part of work, okay? So if you are not accepting to the way that your uh, employees are dealing with their each and individual lives, you're going to build a, a, a distrust. They're not going to trust you. They are not, they're not going to be happy. They're going to have a lower level of respect and, and it could leave them looking for new opportunities and new new work you will drive division within your organization so you make want to make sure that you are accepting of things that are happening within each and every each in their lives because you want to build respect within your your organization now you also want to make sure that you have acceptance of members and how they are going about their day and you need to make sure that your members of their organization have acceptance to the rules and responsibilities of the organization so Again, you need to make sure it's a two way street here. You need to be very clear with the rules, the standards, the flexibility, the recognition, the traditions, the habits. You need to make sure that you are accepting of their habits and their traditions. And, oh, well, I have to, my, you know, my kids go to X sitter on these days. You need to make sure that that is documented. And at the same time, they, the, your employees need to be aware of the standing traditions, core values, things that are happening within your organization. Meaning every Wednesday at one, we have this meeting. Every morning at nine o'clock, we have this meeting. And it's set in stone. And the two should not 
collide. And if they do collide, then there should be leave taken. There should be, you know, things in place where you, you all need to have a, another type of conversation. But if I have employee A and they have to bring their kid to the sitter or daycare every uh, Wednesday at 11, then we need to make sure that's documented somewhere within our organization so that if people go looking for them, client, internal or otherwise, it's well documented as to where they are and we're accepting of this circumstance. Same as same should be known that every morning at nine o'clock we have a stand up and everybody has to be there. And if you miss it, you are in trouble and if or you need to be taking leave and it needs to be well documented prior to that you're not going to be on the call. That is the acceptance that the two sides need to have with one another in order to have a clean and clear relationship. The third one is openness. And so I define this as communication and over communication is what, what we talk about is one of our core values within our organization. And so there's a difference between communicating like I think this or I think that or I feel this or I'm open to feedback on this. And then there's another with totally pulling it into op over communicating where you're like, hey, I just want you to know it, this is not not good or bad, but I just want you to know that this is happening. So you are over communicating your actions because what you don't want to get to is a point where people feel uh, discouraged to speak up, that they feel like uh, it they'll be uh, in trouble for missing uh, certain communication touch points um, because what you don't want is you don't want a deadline to fast approach and the day before people telling you hey we're probably going to miss this deadline because that's going to have repercussions on the, the client relationship as well so if you are over communicating and you're saying hey this is where i'm at with this i know the deadline is two weeks away but i'm having troubles with this i foresee troubles with this and your guys are talking it out it might be a little annoying in terms of how much you're communicating but for the health of your employees and the business it is an absolute necessity over communication is one of our core values and it's something I live and die by. And that is really the reason why our organization has been so successful is because we over communicate with our clients to the point where our clients are like, you don't need to tell me that. And it's like, well, oh, but you know, I feel like I have to just in case and you know, be, I want to make sure that you're in the know and we're not, you know, we're not living behind some uh, steel wall. It, it is very much open and honest conversation. And, and you should encourage that throughout your, your employees, more so than just communicating if they have feedback. It's more than feedback. It is just what, is, what are they doing? How are you feeling? You know, are you sick? What's going on? You know, like, let's be open and honest as overt as possible, overly communicating, over communicate everything. Be extreme openness. The fourth one would be uh, authenticity. So, you need to make sure that you are authentic in everything that you all are doing. You should not be setting core values and then living a totally different way. You need to make sure that you are authentic to yourself and your organization as a leader. And you need to make sure that you are open and honest with your employees so that you are, uh, if you hopefully you have core values, that you are exemplifying those core values. You need to make sure that you are sharing professional backgrounds, that you're creating team rituals, that you are encouraging uh, professional expression, that you are open and authentic with your employees so that they will come to know, like, and trust you if they don't already, so that you guilt, you build this uh, team togetherness, right? So the first one here is managing performance through outcomes, impact, and ownership, okay? The second would be doing more to build trust and togetherness. And the third one would be to facilitate and engage your teams. So you need to make sure that you are encouraging team problem solving. So often times in a remote organization or a hybrid organization, people want to live in their silos. They will uh, throw up their do not disturb on their Microsoft Teams and they'll try to uh, be keyboard warriors and uh, stay to themselves. And then uh, that's how problems arise. It, because if you would just speak up and you over communicate, like we talked about in, in point two, then you could bring in other members to assist. That does not mean that somebody is not good at their job. Okay, that, that's a fear that a lot of employees have. So if you are a hybrid remote leader, you need to make sure that you are open and extremely clear that you want teams to engage with one another. That we 
don't see bringing other members in as an invasion of somebody else's project, but just the way that you operate as an organization. You need to encourage team problem solving. Because if you do not encourage team problem solving and then you do have to bring somebody else in to help uh, an, another employee with, with a job, it will be seen as a negative to the rest of the team and that will uh, lead to problems within your team and within your organization because they will now see that member as incompetent, potentially. And that just drives further division. It alienates that employee. Not something you want. So you want to make sure that you are encouraging team problem solving and encouraging team atmosphere so that everybody's engaged. And we do this internally through uh, multiple ways. But one of the biggest ways that I've found is we talk about where we're going as an organization and getting feedback from all members. So I do this in two different ways. I will message my employees directly and say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think our biggest weakness is? And get them conversating individually. But then I also bring it up in weekly or bi-weekly calls with the team to say, how are things going? What can we do right? What can we do wrong? What can we try differently? What can we do better? What can we commit to going forward? So that everyone knows that this is a very much a team effort going forward. We don't want to build this as a bunch of individuals acting individually, right? We want to build this as a team moving forward that we can only succeed if we are all together moving in the same direction. This is very much a thought process of a sports organization. If you have a bunch, if you play, if you're familiar with team sports, you, you they, they talk about fists a lot, right? So if you have five, you know, I, was, I played basketball, I played a lot of sports, but basketball, they always talk about, you know, five, five hand, five fingers on a hand, right? So you have your five fingers on a hand individually. And so individually, these are not very strong. My fingers are not very strong individually, right? And if I were to try and punch something or hit something, then, you know, I'm, I'm really just slapping you. It might hurt myself <laughs> trying to hit you with my, with my fingers out, right? But if they work together and they form a fist, a fist is a lot more powerful, more dangerous, and can do a lot more than five individual fingers. That's the same general idea that you need to promote without the violence of a fist within your organization. You need to make sure that your teams are engaging and they understand that together they can accomplish a lot more than individually. And when you do that and you encourage members to have team problem solving, whether through activities or otherwise, then when something is happening on a project and you do bring somebody else in, it's not seen as a negative, it's just seen as the way you do business. And so this is a lot of DevOps in general. So those of you who are unaware what DevOps is, I have an entire course, a masterclass on DevOps, but real quick, DevOps, all it is is the development team and the operations team together. Prior to DevOps, it was seen as the developers develop. When they're done, they roll it out, and then you have an operations team who keeps it going, and they're separate and they would blame each other. <laughs> if you bring them together, there it eliminates the, that's not my job. And so you wanna bring that into your organization as a whole. So you wanna have the DevOps mentality, philosophies within your organization to eliminate team members to say, oh, that's not my project, or that's not my, not my client, or that's not my role, or that's not my job. It is everyone's job collectively as your organization and you need to maintain that thought process throughout. I'll leave you with this as leaders, because a lot of leaders who are listening to this might be thinking, well, this is just temporary. I understand that, you know, remote has been big now, but eventually the pendulum will swing back the other way. And I will say, no, that it won't. The, with the progression of AI and collaborative intelligence and automation, there's only going to be a wider span of hybrid remote workforces. And you as leaders need to get good at what I just discussed on this podcast. An April 2021 survey found that 29% of employees would consider switching employers if their company went back to a full on-site model. If you want your employees back in an office space, you need to be ready to lose those employees. And you as a leader, if that is your belief that someday you are going to just bring everybody back and it'll be business as usual, then you need to be ready to lose top performing members of your organization. And maybe you're okay with that. Maybe you are okay with, with wiping the team uh, clean and bringing in new members and new fresh blood and saying this is the way that we're going to be doing it but i will challenge you to say that you should be more forward thinking you should look more 
towards the future of work of this collaborative intelligence and this automation. Not to say that you're, told, you're looking into collaborative intelligence or automation to replace your employees. Don't do that. That's a whole nother bag of worms that we get into on another podcast. But on today's episode, it's more so as bringing your teams together remotely and hybrid to make sure that you all are exploring the future of work and you're not grasping to this dream of, hey, remember when everyone was together and we had an open open concept work environment, everyone was in their cubicles because people weren't actually happy back then, just a FYI. So as leaders, understand the future of work, know that automation and collaborative intelligence is inevitable. It is That is the future of work. And you need to ensure that your workforce is uh, enabled, that you are enabling your people first over your technologies, and you need to make sure that you're bringing them together. You need to make sure you're managing. We'll go over the three again. Managing performance through outcomes, impact, and ownership. At two, you're doing more to build trust and togetherness. And that three, you are facilitating and engaging your teams together in encouraging team problem solving creating an inclusive environment where members do not fear speaking up. Remember, 29% of employees say that they ain't going back. Don't be that leader who tries to alienate your top performers because you're going to have a hard time finding new ones. Guys, hope you enjoyed this podcast. Check us out. We do have a website coming up, goworkwherever.com. You can check us out on YouTube at, on Capital Presence where we have all of our video feeds. We have how-to videos. We have uh, a lot of master classes and training videos there as well on hybrid remote and Microsoft environment. We uh, This podcast is wherever you listen to your podcast, iTunes, Amazon Music, Spotify, all of that stuff. We do go live in the Go Work Wherever Facebook group as well once a week. So if you go to Facebook, Dot com and go search go work wherever you'll find that private community it is private because we want to make sure that only the right people are joining it because this is a podcast for those who are forward thinking who are thinking about the future of work who are looking to grow uh, in areas of collaborative intelligence and automation the right way to make sure that they are still putting people first people uh, people over processes and processes over technology that is the way that we go about things here uh, we think that the office is the bad guy, but also AI is the bad guy. And we want to live in a very healthy place in between. So guys, go work wherever, be out in the nature, and live every day like it's Saturday. Hey there, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications for all the latest videos from Capital Presence.